Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a mango White Claw. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking an Aperol Spritz. On today's episode, we're exploring the infamous murder of Kitty Genovese and how her death helped in the creation of 911. Catherine Susan Kitty Genovese was born on July 7, 1935 in Brooklyn, New York to Rachel and Vincent Genovese. Kitty was the eldest of five children. She was described as a good student who had a happy demeanor and was wise beyond her years. During her senior year of high school, Kitty was voted class cut-up. She was talkative, popular, and had an infectious laugh. Everyone wanted to be around her. In 1953, following her high school graduation, her family moved to New Canaan, Connecticut, after her mother witnessed a murder in New York City. Kitty remained in the city, however, and in the fall of 1954, she married Rocco Fazalaire. Their marriage was quickly annulled, and they divorced in 1956. She then moved into her own apartment in Brooklyn. By day, she worked as a secretary at an insurance company, and at night, she was a bartender. In August of 1961, Kitty was arrested for bookmaking when she and her friend D. Guardinari were caught taking bets on horse races from bar patrons. They were fined $50, and Kitty unfortunately lost her job. She then got a job at a bar called Ev's 11th Hour, where she eventually became manager. Her customers loved Kitty and made note of how reliable and friendly she was. In the spring of 1963, Kitty met her girlfriend, Marianne Zelenko at a gay bar in Greenwich Village, and they soon moved in together. The couple enjoyed going to bars, listening to live music, and eating at a local German restaurant. In 2004, Marianne told the Chicago Tribune, quote, We meshed. I'm very quiet, and she talked a lot. We both had struggles with our sexuality, as did many people back then. We had a quick bond, end quote. Their apartment in the Kew Gardens neighborhood of Queens was said to be peaceful and in a safe area. In the early morning hours of March 13, 1964, Kitty was on her way home from work at the bar when she was attacked with a hunting knife by 29-year-old Winston Mosley. She parked her car in the lot across from her apartment when Winston approached her. She attempted to run to the front door of her apartment building when Mosley stabbed her twice in the back. Kitty reportedly screamed, quote, oh my God, he stabbed me. Help me. Please help me, end quote. Her neighbor, Robert Moser, saw the attack from his window and yelled, quote unquote, let that girl alone, which caused Winston to run. Injured, Kitty staggered to the back of the apartment building where she was out of sight from her neighbors. Once inside the building, she collapsed in the foyer leading to the staircase. Ten minutes later, Winston came back, continued to stab Kitty, raped her, and stole the money she was carrying. The assault lasted around 35 minutes. She was then found by neighbor and friend Sophia Farrar, who yelled for someone to call the police and held Kitty in her arms until authorities arrived seven minutes later. Kitty sadly died en route to the hospital. She was just 28 years old at the time of her death, and was the 636th murder victim in New York City that year. An autopsy later showed that she had 13 stab wounds on her body and several defensive wounds on her hands. Around 4 a.m., police spoke with Marianne and notified her of Kitty's murder, and she was asked to identify her body. Hours later, Detective Mitchell Sang arrived to question her. She was being consoled by neighbor Carl Ross, who was given Marianne liquor. Detective Sang would then arrest Ross for disorderly conduct. He also had his suspicions about Ross since Kitty had been found at the bottom of the stairs leading to Ross's apartment. Marianne was eventually questioned by two other homicide detectives for six hours and considered a suspect. The detectives narrowed in on the woman's relationship and asked Marianne inappropriate questions pertaining to their sex life. Neighbors who spoke with the police also said that much of the questioning centered on their quote-unquote gay lifestyle. Just under a week after Kitty's murder, police received a call about a potential robbery. The suspect in question was Winston Mosley. 
Police arrested Winston in Ozone Park after finding a TV in his car's trunk. After he was brought to the police station, Winston confessed to dozens of other appliance robberies. Winston drove a white Corvair, and during the interrogation, one of the detectives remembered that several witnesses to Kitty's murder reported seeing a white car. Homicide detectives were brought in and noticed visible scars on Winston's hands. The detectives then accused Winston of killing Kitty, and he confessed to the crime. Winston shared details about the crime scene with the police that only the killer would know. He told them he had seen Kitty at a traffic light while sitting in his parked car and decided to follow her home. He admitted to driving around the neighborhood looking for a victim, but gave no motive for the murder other than wanting to kill a woman. After stabbing Kitty and being scared off, Winston waited in his car to see if police would show up. When they didn't, he decided to return. During the attack, he did hear someone open their door, and when they didn't do anything, he continued attacking Kitty. Winston would later confess to several other rapes as well as the brutal murders of Annie Mae Johnson and 15-year-old Barbara Kralik. Winston was married with two children, and prior to his arrest, he had no criminal record. Winston's trial began in June 1964. He was only charged with the murder of Kitty and originally pleaded not guilty but his attorney later changed his plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. On June 15, 1964, Winston was sentenced to death for Kitty's murder. His sentence was reduced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 1967. A year later, Winston escaped from prison while being transported back from the hospital after having a minor procedure. He was on the run for several days, during which he held four people hostage on two separate occasions and raped a woman. He was given two additional 15-year sentences to run concurrently with his life sentence. Winston later claims that a mobster murdered Kitty and that he was only the getaway driver. During his trial and while incarcerated, Winston showed no remorse for Kitty's death. He died in jail in March 2016 at 81 years old and was one of the longest-serving inmates in the New York State prison system. Kitty's murder did not get much media attention until two weeks after her death, when the New York Times published an article titled, quote, 37 who saw murder didn't call the police, end quote, alleging that multiple neighbors heard or witnessed Kitty's murder and did not help her and essentially blamed them for her death. The piece was based on a conversation the New York Times editor, A.M. Rosenthal, had with police commissioner Michael Murphy. The 37 or 38 witnesses included people in nearby apartment buildings who were named in the police report. The next day, the newspaper shared an analysis of Kitty's murder and spoke to several experts on the psychology of why people would choose not to get involved. No other newspapers or reporters followed with the 38 witnesses and they did not question the article because the New York Times was so respected. News about Kitty's murder and the lack of assistance by witnesses spread across the country like wildfire and caused people to reflect. That same year, Rosenthal released a book titled 38 Witnesses, The Kitty Genovese Case. The New York Times has since been criticized for its coverage of the case. Many accused them of sensationalism and factual errors. In recent years, journalists have come together to debunk the New York Times claims. It has been proven that only two neighbors, not 38, were aware of the fact that Kitty was being murdered outside their home. One of those neighbors was Carl Ross, who we mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Ross was drinking the night of Kitty's murder. He heard noises outside his apartment and waited before opening his door to look. When he eventually did, he saw Kitty being stabbed by Winston and trying to speak. Kitty was still alive at the time. Ross then called a friend asking what to do. The friend told him, quote-unquote, not to get involved, a phrase that has become highly associated with this case. Ross then went to a neighbor's apartment and called the police when Sophia Farrar yelled for help. According to the New York Daily News, some residents of Kitty's apartment building later said they assumed the assault was the usual closing time ruckus from Old Bailey's, a boisterous bar below the apartment. 
In reality, many of those 38 witnesses the police mentioned were technically ear witnesses, not eyewitnesses. Some reported hearing a scream, but when they looked out the window, they saw nothing. Some saw Winston run away, then return, but assumed Kitty was safe inside by then. A number of people did say they called the police, and at least one neighbor said she was blown off by the operator who said, quote-unquote, we already got the call. However, the police logs only show Carl Ross's call. Kitty's story has become part of New York City history and left a lasting legacy on the nation as a whole, even if the truth of the case is still not widely known. It's even gone on to inspire plays, musicals, and TV dramas, among many other things. In 2015, Kitty's brother Bill released the documentary The Witness, which showcased Bill's journey to learn more about Kitty's murder and quote-unquote reclaim her life from her death. Bill was 16 at the time of her murder and was very close to Kitty. His family was not given many details of the case, nor did they talk about Kitty or their grief following her murder. The Genovistas did not attend the 1964 trial and did not know many details of the crime until 1995 when Winston filed for a retrial. They generally took news headlines for their word and lived their lives thinking that was the truth about Kitty's death. Mary Ann Zelenko told the Chicago Tribune in 2004 that she is still haunted by the image of Kitty's body, but she remembers her as one of the most wonderful people she's met. She does think people could have stepped in and saved Kitty's life, and for some time Mary Ann blamed herself for Kitty's death. At the time of Kitty's murder, the Genovese family did not know Mary and Kitty were in a relationship, and when they did find out, Mary Ann was not allowed to be involved in Kitty's funeral. Mary Ann had reached out to the Genovese's multiple times over the years, but did not have much success until around 2004 when Bill called her. She shared that if Kitty were alive today, she believes that Kitty would be happily owning a bar somewhere. Del, what are your thoughts on the murder of Kitty and everything that followed? So I think that this is one of the most prominent murders that I remember actually learning about in school as a psychology major because of all the ramifications that came from this case. And though it did turn out to be false, I think that a lot of good study in academia, especially psychology, has come from it. I do think that it's definitely really sad that someone had to die for us to study stuff like the bystander effect, which we will get into later. When it comes to Winston Mosley, I do think he's a really disgusting person. And the fact that he killed a woman just because he wanted to kill a woman and ended up raping and murdering other women just shows the type of person he is, along with the fact that he never showed any remorse. I do think that it's really good that Marianne was finally able to get some type of closure with Kitty's family in the form of her brother, Bill, because I feel like sometimes when people have a shared loss, they're able to grieve together. And the fact that Marianne was missing that because Kitty's family, they didn't approve of their relationship. I do think that's really sad. I wish that the New York Times got more of a reprimand for the lies that they published. Although good work came out of it, I feel like as a respected newspaper, as journalists, you have to make sure that the information that you're printing, especially when it has such a slanderous effect, that it's true. Because in publishing that story, they really painted the neighbors as people who didn't care, who care more about themselves than they care for the life of a young woman. And that clearly wasn't the truth of the matter. So I do hope that something like this doesn't happen again, but I'm not going to hold my breath. What are your thoughts on this case? So going into this, I thought the details of this case were totally different. It was like a 180 from what the case actually was. I don't know why But I thought that this was like a dispute between a husband and wife that led to a woman's murder. I think some of the ear witnesses did think that's what was going on. And maybe that's just kind of how it's been diluted a little in the media. 
I had no idea it was like a random attack. I never knew about kitty sexuality either. I don't think that's something, not that it's really relevant to the case, but hearing about how the police like zeroed in on that at first is upsetting. I mean, it was the 1960s, so I'm not really that surprised, but still, it's kind of upsetting to hear. And it almost seems like it's something that's like covered up with the case. I totally agree. Winston Mosley is disgusting and very scary. The audacity for him to return to the scene to murder her to ensure that she died and suffered. And in The Witness, the documentary, which Kitty's brother worked on, I definitely recommend people watch that because it's a really interesting, it's fascinating to me. You would think a family member would know all the details of their loved one's death. But like we said, the family really didn't talk about Kitty after she died because it was just too hard for them. So to hear him as an adult man, how many decades removed from this case, he's finally like now starting to heal and going through the motions and talking to these people that lived with Kitty and knew Kitty is really interesting. I haven't seen any documentary like that before. But he does sit down, he tries to sit down with Winston Mosley, but he ends up sitting down with Winston Mosley's son. And that's kind of like an upsetting part too. I mean, I would say, I'm sure Winston Mosley's son has had a a very difficult, painful life as well, having a father that did murder people, especially in such an infamous case but he said he felt like his dad deserved to be out of jail which you know i understand from a son's perspective but he escaped and then look what he did you know he killed multiple people and when he had the chance to get out with this escape he still went on a crime spree and raped someone and he winston mosley i think has said that He's a victim because the case was so high profile and it's like hard for him to live in prison with that because I guess the other inmates go after him, which I can understand. But how dare you say you are a victim when you murdered people? That doesn't sit well with me. I've also heard that Winston Mosley once told the parole board that he considered the crime Kitty's death a mugging because they sometimes end in murder. And he just goes back and forth so many different things. He told the police he went out, his intent was to murder a woman. And he was like, essentially hunting people down in his car. And then to go and say, oh, it was actually just a mugging. No, it wasn't. We all know that's not true. I totally agree. I think that the New York Times should have gotten some kind of reprimand. Because people, how many decades later, still do believe what their original writing said and it's really fascinating to me that they were so respected and that's why people didn't really go after them and that's kind of upsetting to hear because you do think of the new york times today as a very highly regarded and trustworthy newspaper and i understand people can't always get it right but i feel like they just so majorly got it wrong because they didn't really do deeper work And Del, you and I were talking about this before we started recording. It's almost like a good and bad thing that they didn't do this because it's not right that the details of Kitty's death are so wrong in the public and that she's become a legend, but like we don't really know about her. We don't really even know the real details of her death, but it is good in a way because it made people reflect and think, okay, well, you know, we need to support one another. We need to be on guard and looking out for each other. We're going to talk about the history of 911 and Kitty's murder did help 911 get pushed along. And like you said, this whole new branch of psychology, which is true, the bystander effect is a real thing that was created. It's so fascinating how this one person's death and that it was reported on wrong has had such an impact because If it wasn't, Kitty wouldn't be remembered. She would just be another New York City murder victim. Yeah, and that was a number that was really staggering to me. The fact that she was number 636 in March. Like, if that doesn't tell you the environment 
that was going on around and how, like you said, it is definitely because of the falsehood and how sensationalized it was that this was the murder that was picked up. Yeah, it really is like, I don't know, right? I don't want to say right place, right time, but that article hit at the right time when people were paying attention. Kitty's murder is considered one of the driving forces for the 911 emergency call system in the United States. In 1957, the National Association of Fire Chiefs became the first advocates for a single number for reporting fires. At the time of Kitty's death, if people needed to call the police or fire department, they had to dial zero to reach a telephone operator and then wait to be connected. One of Kitty's neighbors, who was a child at the time of her murder, claimed his father called the police to report a woman being beaten, but there was no answer at the police station. People were very worried and felt very unsafe after Kitty's murder, and I think that was really nationwide, not just in New York. Shocked by Kitty's death and her neighbor's quote-unquote apathy, her local officials joined the charge in creating a unified emergency response protocol. In 1967, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration for Justice recommended a single number for reporting of emergency situations. In 1968, AT&T, who operated nearly all telephone connections at the time, announced it would establish the digits 911 as the emergency code throughout the United States and the first 911 call was made on February 16, 1968 in Haleyville, Alabama. It was chosen because it's brief, easy to remember, and can be dialed quickly. The plan was for state public utility agencies to have control despite the number being national. This allowed responses to be answered at a local level. It later advanced and the system automatically transmitted information to dispatcher. Not every area has access to 911, but through the 1970s and 1980s, it quickly spread, and now 96% of the geographic United States is covered by some type of 911 system. Changes have been made with the rise in cell phone usage, and the NextGen 911 system initiative was developed. I thought it was really interesting. Like, I would never, it makes sense that, like, they chose those because, like, it's fast, it's easy to remember, and it can be dialed quickly. And in reading this, like, people had rotary phones, like, when this came out. So, like, that's really, which was in the forefront. So I thought that was kind of interesting to hear. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think it was one of those no-brainer things that you want a dedicated system in place for people to get the help they need. Because in a lot of these situations where you're calling emergency services, time is of the essence, right? You have, if you're calling the ambulance, the concept of the golden hour, which means you want to have the person to the hospital within an hour for the best outcome for a lot of emergency medical situations. In the case of fires, in the case of crime happening. You want to have that quick response. And also, I think that it also added a system of dispatchers who are people that are specifically trained to handle those emergency calls. Because it's not just about receiving the calls. It's about having someone on the other end that is able to navigate chaotic situation, calm the person down, as well as not only get the information from the person who is in a emotional state, but relay that information to the relevant emergency services. Absolutely. I think soldered children kind of came into my mind as you were talking about that. I know that they're, did they go missing like the 40s or the 50s? It says 1945. And yeah, I mean, I don't know if 911 would have helped them out, but because Like people called the fire department and like no one was there because it was near Christmas and they were on vacation. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the problem in that case is they took two hours to get there. Yeah. I I think, but it may have helped because if I'm remembering the details correctly, and I might not include this if I'm not, but wasn't the system that they had was that 
one person got the call they called the next person yeah the, the telephone tree yeah so if they had a system where all the people that needed to get the information got it at one time i think that definitely would have been official in that case yeah especially too if like the children were driven away like someone could have been out on the road looking for them exactly yeah but i don't know how much it would have helped but eliminating the telephone tree would have went a long way so wild to think about okay as we've said kitty's murder became synonymous with apathy and everything going wrong with the united states at the time it also helped coin the term the bystander effect according to psychology today the bystander effect occurs when the presence of others discourages an individual from intervening in an emergency situation against a bully or during an assault or other crime The greater the number of bystanders, the less likely it is for any one of them to provide help to a person in distress. People are more likely to take action in a crisis when there are few or no other witnesses present. Social psychologists Bib Latane and John Darley helped popularize the concept of the bystander effect. They attributed the bystander effect to diffusion of responsibility and social influence. Perceived diffusion of responsibility means that the more onlookers there are, the less personal responsibility individuals feel to take action. And social influence means that individuals monitor the behavior of those around them to determine how to act. This is based on the human need to behave in correct and socially acceptable ways. When other observers fail to react, individuals often take this as a signal that a response is not needed or not appropriate. Anyone can be complicit in this quote-unquote bad behavior. Fear can also influence whether or not people help during an emergency. People worry that they might be misunderstanding the context and seeing a threat where there is none, or even that intervening will put your own life in danger. Researchers have found that onlookers are less likely to intervene if the situation is ambiguous. In Kitty's case, many of the 38 witnesses reported that they believed that they were witnessing a quote-unquote lover's quarrel and did not realize the young woman was actually being murdered. A crisis is often chaotic and the situation is not always crystal clear. During these moments, People often look to others in the group to determine what is appropriate. When they see that no one is reacting, it sends a signal that perhaps no action is needed. The opposite of being a passive bystander is being an active bystander. One way to be an active bystander is to behave as if you are the first or the only person witnessing a problem. Active bystanders are more effective when they assume that they themselves are the sole person taking charge. Giving direction to other bystanders to assist can therefore be critically important. Another recommendation is to single out one person from the crowd, make eye contact, and ask that person specifically for help. By personalizing and individualizing your request, it becomes much harder for a person to turn you down. Del, have you ever been affected by the bystander effect? I don't think I have, but I think that's because when I got to the age that I would even be the right person to respond to an emergency, like being an older teen or an adult, I had already gone through years of first aid and CPR training, which adds this in the training, making sure that you're an active bystander, you know, doing that training, like we just talked about, of being very specific in the request you make. So you say, person A, call 911. Person B, see if anyone else is hurt. You know, like you get trained on that during first aid and CPR training. So I don't think I've ever been affected by it. And I think that with more awareness of the bystander effect, like what I had in school through majoring in psychology, hopefully less people are affected by it. But of course, you do have those social pressures that come into mind. So while I don't blame anyone for being affected by it, I hope people do know the impact it can have um, during a emergency situation. 
How about you? I definitely have. I think more so in terms of like we listed bullying as an example of the bystander effect not intervening. And I definitely have in that sense. I am definitely someone I was very introverted and shy and quiet, like growing up. There are so many I can't, you know, think of many in particular, but there are definitely times where I wish I would have stood up for other people. I don't think I've failed to act in like any emergency situations. Although I definitely have (laughs) kind of called my parents to confirm like, hey, should I do something like, I don't know, for example, there was a car accident on my street like sometime last year I guess it was and at first I didn't realize it was a car accident with the noise but I looked out my window and I was like oh my god this car is on its side so I had called my mom to say like what should I do but then like as I was about to call 911 all these other people rushed out so I kind of knew it was okay in that situation and I know in some emergencies like the less people around the better too because like we did say like it can get very chaotic in emergencies and like everyone kind of needs to be doing something and not just like being frantic and making the situation worse but it's definitely hard with the social pressure and you know, in certain situations like i definitely can see people not acting because they feel unsafe which is really unfortunate because i think you do always have to like look out for your own safety but if you can act definitely do it Yeah, I definitely agree. And that's why in a lot of the trainings that you get, one of the first things that they teach you is to make sure that you're safe, to make sure that the surroundings are safe. For example, if a car accident was happening, you know, to check to make sure that there's no leaks, like gas leaks and stuff like that before you attend to the person because you want to make sure that you have as much information as possible. Like, do you need to move the person? You know, questions like that. I know it may sound selfish, but I definitely agree that you should never knowingly put yourself in harm's way. And I don't think that people that talk about the bystander effect are asking people to put themselves in harm's way. I think it's just more of being more aware of your surroundings and your ability to help someone who is in a crisis or emergency situation. Definitely. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the case of Kitty Genovese. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the Sasha's King murders. As always, stay safe.